Please welcome Lori Leitman. It's such a, a, a rare opportunity to have a, a living composer in our midst. I mean, I, I think I've been in the opera business, I think, 28 years, and I think Laurie's maybe the only third, third living composer I've worked with. You know, we usually schedule productions for the 200th anniversary of Verdi's birth or something. <laughs> but, or, or people say, we, we, we want that performed the way Mozart intended, but we, we don't really have a note from him that says, this is what I intend. And in this case, we can, we can just call Laurie up and say, what do you intend, Laurie? <laughs> <laughs> so, so please uh, feel free to, to think about questions for her. Um, I know Laurie started out as an instrumentalist, and we, we were sort of interested to ask her how one goes makes that leap from being an instrumentalist to composing. It seems really daunting. And I uh, well, thought that might be a fascinating. Can you all hear me? I have yes, this wonderful microphone. Great. Okay, great. So I uh, was born into a musical family. My mother was a musician and my sisters were musicians. And I grew up uh, playing piano and flute. And my whole early childhood was um, geared towards becoming a professional flutist. You know, I studied. I went to New York City every weekend for lessons from the time I was nine, and I went to music camp, and, and I went to Yale uh, with the full intention of being uh, becoming a flutist, and I was a, a very good flutist. It wasn't until I got to Yale, actually, that I met other composers. They were all my friends, and I thought, oh my gosh, if they can do it, I can do it better. <laughs> Uh, I, I, be, I started to study composition because prior to that, should I be looking at you or everybody else? <laughs> Can you speak up just a bit? Sure. Is that is that better? If yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So you can so maybe move it. Yeah. So I got to Yale. Is that better? Yes. And um, all of my friends were composers, and I thought, you know, that I, if they could do it, I could do it too. Uh, and it turns out I could do it, uh, which was good. It, <laughs> it, was a, it was a revelation. Um, and I started writing um, sort of small piece. Well, I started writing piano ragtime, actually, because I love playing piano and I love playing ragtime. And ragtime had a very distinct structure to it. You had eight bars or 16 bars, and those were repeated. And then you had another 16 bars, and then you had a middle section. And that was a great starting point for me as a composer because I had a structure that I could fill in and sort of like fill in the blanks, and that was great. Um, later, I, um, I studied how to compose for film and theater, which was a very big interest of mine. And I learned how to respond to different moods in a film or a theater uh, piece, a theater work, a play. Um, and, and now, the way I approach poems and words and opera is just I view every libretto or every poem as a baby film. So I feel I'm still writing film music. I'm writing dramatic music to illuminate the words and the meanings behind the words. So it was sort of um, not the best of reasons, I guess, to become a composer. I just thought it was a cool thing to do. <laughs> I, I wanted to do it, so I did it. <laughs> and, and very well. You've well got, thank you. You've, how many art songs do you have? Oh, I ha you know, I haven't counted. I just, you know, I used to just go on my website and physically count, like one, two, three, and then I lose track and I have to start again. So finally, I made a spreadsheet. You know, um, <laughs> I haven't added everything, so I don't know. It's something approaching two hundred and fifty. But here's the interesting thing. You know, so I was writing film and theater music early in my career, and um, I, I wrote a lot of these little film scores for industrial films, for magazines, Psychology Today, Camera Arts, I worked with a filmmaker in New York City. And then I had kids, and then I couldn't really write film music, because when you have kids and you're up all night, you can't be up all night writing music, too. You know. So I just sort of wrote chamber music, and in the 80s I wrote, wrote a lot of music for koto and flute. I was a flutist, and I had a koto playing friend, so you know that was it. But it wasn't until 1991, and I had a very good friend who had been my roommate in Interlochen Music Camp, and she won all of these competitions. She was a wonderful soprano, and one of the prizes was for her to make 
a debut CD, and she said, I want you to write songs from my CD. And I said, I can't do that. I don't know how to write a song. I don't know anything about poetry. And she was very insistent that I do this. So I started to listen to her songs, and she liked singing, and started to read poetry. And then I wrote my first song. Um, and it was also a revelation, because I really probably wrote that song in about 10 minutes. It was just like so easy for me. I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, this can't be any good because this is way too easy. <laughs> I thought I should throw it out, but my husband said, well, that's really beautiful. Don't throw it out. Anyway, I never stopped uh, after that, and I just keep writing songs because for me, the whole thrill is in translating the words into a musical gesture and image. And I am very, very respectful for the words. I never, I guess this may be a later question, but I'll answer it now. You know? <laughs> um, I never get a musical idea and then put words to it. Everything is custom crafted to make the words sing. And so all of my structure, the structure that I used to have from the ragtime, you know, all of the structure I develop from my desire to illuminate the poem. The, the poem tells me what to do. And, and it's, it's not just David Mason that you work oh, with. Oh, no, no, no. Maybe Lots like of living and dead poets. Say, say yes. you work <laughs> uh, about what sort of material inspires you, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and is it all poetry, or do you sometimes write into prose? No, I hate writing into prose, and I can tell you why. Um, because prose is too many words. <laughs> um, the, the great thing for me about using a poem is that it's all, the, the thought is crystallized. And, and the thought is so crystallized that it, it allows space for the music to come in and say something about the words. If you have prose and you have a lot, I know there are some composers who like using prose, and that's great, but it's not, it's not what I like to do. I like to, uh, you know, it, it's good for a poem to have breathing space so that the music can come in and fill in the emotions and, and say something about the words. And in terms of the poets, you know, um, I've, I've said so many different poets. I love working with um, living poets because uh, just like a living composer, I can call them up or I can email them or I can Facebook message them and say, what does this mean, you know? And uh, with Emily Dickinson, it's a little bit harder. So um, <laughs> I can't do that, but I love Emily Dickinson. And, um, you know, I mean, basically, I like all poems that are good poems. <laughs> and and some, some poems are very good poems, but they're too complex to set to music. They're just too long or whatever. You need to really think about them and look at them on a page. But if you're writing a song, and this is an oral tradition, and people are listening to you communicate this, it has to be a poem that can be able to be grasped, at least on some level, on a first hearing. So poems that are, are not too long, although I've said very long poems, but they, they present their own challenge, or too short, you know, uh, but something that, that enables the listener to follow along is very, very essential. And um, sometimes, I guess the greatest frustration in terms of if I found a poem that I like, you know, you always have to get permission first. And if it's a living poet and they control their permission, that's great. Sometimes you have a living poet and they don't control their permission, because they've signed the rights over to their publisher. I wonder if you'd like to tell us about how the two of you met or, or sure. came to work together. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm sorry I'm not looking at you. I'm, no, no, I'm no, talking no, to everybody. No, no. So, uh, for their benefit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe what your first work together was and how sure. that came about. So um, I got a call, I think it was March of 2004, from the Westchester Poetry Conference. And they wanted to commission me and two other women composers to all set a poem by David Mason called Swimmers on the Shore. This was a poem that was very serious poem about when David realized that his father was beginning to battle Alzheimer's. And um, immediately, uh, because of my competitive nature, I thought, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this piece and it's going to, you know, and these other two women are going to write it, but mine's going to be the best. <laughs> I know I shouldn't say that. That's what I, that's what I felt. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I also thought, well, this is great because, um, you know, when you have a poem with a very serious subject, for me, that's a real gift because there's so much depth to it 
that you can get a lot of ideas from it. So love is great to write about, death is great, Alzheimer's is great, you know? And um, there was a lot in that poem that I could draw from. And um, I had about a month to write it, and I wrote it. And then it was being premiered on the same day that my Cleveland Opera, opera was being premiered. So I could not go to the concert, and I could not meet Dave. But you know, by that point I had called him up, I had read his poetry, I had emailed him, and uh, we started a relationship, you know, through emails. And um, I finally got to meet Dave the next year at the Westchester Poetry Conference, and we had an immediate rapport. He was just so open and so friendly. And um, that's how we met. And, and had that poem of his won a competition of theirs, or how, how did oh, that poem? I don't know how they decided to choose that poem, oh. or how they, you know, frankly chose any of the three of us to set it. But it's it's always interesting. I think, you know, a, a song is merely a composer's <coughs> interpretation of a poem, and so it's always interesting to me to hear multiple interpretations. It's just like an actor, and you, uh, you might have three actors who could say the same scene totally differently. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily that one is better or worse or whatever. Everything is just different. And um, we all brought different things to Dave's poem. So you did get to hear the other two songs? Well, I got a recording. <laughs>